I'm Dr. Henrik Schönefeld. I'm Senior Lecturer in Sustainable Architecture at the Kent School of Architecture and Planning. And my current research project is based um, at the Houses of Parliament. Of course, we're all very familiar with this side of the palace, but there's one aspect of the building that people are less familiar with. And this is the fact that it's many towers, which you can see here, including the Victoria Tower over there and the clock tower on this side, are not just architectural embellishments, but they are functional features of a 19th century ventilation system. The primary aims of the project is to develop a detailed and critical understanding of the original 19th century ventilation system and the way it had shaped the architecture. But what's significant about the palace is the degree to which technology was um, allowed to influence its architectural design, both internally and externally. So we are currently inside the Lord's debating chamber, which illustrates very clearly how these ventilation requirements had actually shaped the detailing of ceilings, floors and the galleries. So when we're looking up on the chamber, we can see, for instance, that there is gilded lettering around the edge of each of these square panels. They were actually carved to be um, permeable to air because these were vents. These were used to extract the hot air from the House of Lords through the ceiling. And on the top of each of these panels, you might have noticed a small little Tudor roses. And they are actually carved to allow fresh air to be injected um, through the coving of that gallery. So this is really an interesting essay of actually how the Victorians integrated utilitarian requirements within the architectural design of the interiors. What Henrik's research really gives us is a complete insight into all the historic voids. And that's important for us for many reasons. One, one of the driving things for the programme is to replace all the mechanical and electrical infrastructure. So that's everything that you need to keep a building running. Lots of that will run through all those old historic voids. So have a complete map of where they all are is vital. And it's also vital to understand that from a fire perspective. So one of the big challenges we have here is the long-term fire risk of the palace. And to understand that network of voids is crucial. So here we got um, a rare example of the original um, 1840s cast iron flooring. And studying and understanding their purpose will help us to, uh, in the restoration renewal program to understand how far we can actually work with those historic features again. Is, would it be possible, for instance, to actually reutilize these historic methods of air inlets in the new design of the palace? The part of the research is to explore how a knowledge of these historic principles of environmental design can be used as a basis to develop a new sustainable approach to ventilation and climate control in the palace, and also as a way of reconciling the requirements of sustainability and heritage, which they are often seen as conflicting. This is actually the location of the original control room of the House of Commons. But now the only remains of this original control system is the periscope, which we can see over here. Now this periscope is quite significant in terms of um, the approach to environmental control, because it was used to monitor the number of members within the chamber and also observe the types of activities that were happening. So when the House of Commons, for instance, was um, preparing for votes, when the system had to be adjusted. So this is an example of historic environmental control technology. We can still go and look through the lens and we can observe what's going on inside the chamber. So now we are currently in the basement and right below central lobby. We've got a palace that is about 300 meters long and to allow the air to be distributed to every location, they use the basement um, passages to move the air from one end to the other. This is quite important in terms of the research, is to look at what has survived, but also looking at what has um, been lost in order to get a comprehensive understanding of the whole system.
being able to take Henrik's work and create something like this BIM model, which is a three-dimensional view of what we are, will save enormous amounts of time, enormous amounts of complexity of where we would normally go in on a major project side. Once you've got that scan data, um, you can then begin to build a, a model from it. What we're now able to do with Henrik's research is make use of that um, very in very useful, very valuable report and um, studies and research to begin to integrate that information into the model so that you, we actually model what you can't see. And that's where it really gets quite special. When we started, I, I wasn't really sure, like, okay, the voids, ventilation voids, it's kind of natural how the air goes. But when we started building it, it makes so much sense that we have fresh air, we have vitiated air, we have smoke air. And it's really amazing. And of course, we learn something. We learn a lot how it works inside the building. So mm. we can use this, uh, this uh, knowledge for the future work. This archive holds a number of important documents relating to the life of the historic ventilation system. And here we got an example of a historic logbook in which the staff that was operating the systems were logging temperatures, the number of people in the chamber, and also making notes on operational procedures they were undertaking on feedback that they had received from members of parliament during particular sittings, etc. So there are essentially two main reasons why it's important to look at these operational aspects. The first is to actually understanding how historically effective these systems were. And this critical understanding allows us then to reevaluate these past systems and seeing how far they can be improved and adapted today to meet modern requirements. Henrik's research, I think, has revealed aspects of our understanding of the building, which we understood that there was a ventilating system uh, designed within, within the, um, the fabric of the, the building. That was known. But exactly how it worked and exactly what it was that, that made it work um, was not fully understood. And I think that um, having that level of specialist technical expertise within the field of conservation allows us to develop a much more sophisticated view of what the, what the Palace of Westminster is. One tends to regard um, science technology as having a linear trajectory, that, that, that there's a progress and a development. And of course that's, that's a false perception and, and, and often um, things are developed for very specific reasons. Mechanical air conditioning had a very specific genesis. Um, and it's now quite interesting to be able to go back and say, well, in the middle of the 19th century, people were still thinking about how to ventilate and cool buildings. They'd begun to work out that there was a science behind this. And perhaps those now can be brought back to life. And there's a very tantalizing um, possibility that the semi naturally ventilated mid 19th century Palace of Westminster could be made to work again, that we could make this a, a, uh, um, a carbon neutral building by um, uh, restoring its, its original design ventilating system. The legacy part of all this is not just within the program and how we plan it going forward, but it will, will, as far as we possibly can, it will be an open door to other industry, to, to the wider industry, I should say, to other heritage projects. So all of the work that Henrik's doing here related to this type of building and then how we apply and how the fact that what Henrik has learned means that we can get now through this piece a certain type of robotics that maybe doesn't even exist yet, but we can design and build. Once we've done that, then for future programs to protect the UK's heritage buildings throughout, it's a fantastic piece of legacy. The principles that Henry has worked on here, you can apply in broad brush terms to any sort of project. So whether that's um, the heating of a parish church or uh, a listed uh, domestic house or commercial offices. Um, and in fact, almost of any sort of existing building. And so even a building that is modern in five years' time, 10 years' time, 20 years' time, when you want to modify it, it's that same sort of thought process of what were the designers trying to do 
um, what were their parameters they were working to, um, did they succeed, can we learn from those lessons of history. The transferability of now recognising that, that there is conservation of building services as a, as a specific um, discipline, as it were, uh, I think that's, that's, an, that's really quite exciting and, and an emerging uh, field and I feel that there are many other um, buildings, perhaps of other periods, where that, um, um, that can be developed further. The level of insight that I gained through this type of research also has a practical application and a practical value alongside its scholarly value. And that's personally because of my background in architecture I value very, very much because it's really important that you can bridge the gap between scholarship on one side and um, practical knowledge on the other. I feel really honoured to be able to work on a project like this, to have the opportunity to actually take my knowledge, develop it, and being able to feed directly into the whole process of restoration. I mean, seeing it, hopefully, it being actually constructively utilised to refurbish the building, of course, that um, will fill me with a sense of pride in the long run, I hope. Thank you.